For the last few weeks, we've been in this series that we title Staying Positive in a Negative World. And uh, we look at social media, as we look at the news, as we look at everything that is going around us, there's a lot of reasons why we should be discouraged. In fact, I've read a few posts this week from some of you who said, I'm tired of politics, I'm tired of this negativity, and I'm going to refrain from Facebook. And if I post anything, it's going to be only positive things. I commend you. That's why I don't post anything anymore. Uh, it, it is crazy out there, and definitely that we need a word of, word of encouragement. And what's unfortunate is that it's a lot easier to get discouraged than to be encouraged nowadays because of all the things that are going around. And perhaps for times like this is when the author of the letter to the Hebrews said in chapter 3, verse 13, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, you must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. The author gives us two reasons why we should be positive and, and uh, two ways to be positive and one reason why we should still be positive, even in the middle of negativity. The first way, it says, that we should warn each other. And this is a thing that has to be done a, a, as a team effort. It is very difficult to encourage yourself, although we'll talk about that later at the end. But it says that one another, you know, we should be helping each other out instead of be putting each other down. It is crazy with how today people are attacking each other. And uh, the more that we get closer to the, to the, to the election day, it's going to be even worse. So we need encouragement. We need to help each other out. We need words that are nice and positive. And that's the first thing that he says, that, that we have to help each other up. And the second thing that he says is that what well, is still today. One of the things that oftentimes we forget is that whatever happened yesterday doesn't have to dictate what will happen to me tomorrow. And that means that today, today is the most important day. Because it is today when I decide to remain in the negativity or, or the discouragement that I experienced yesterday or to move on and, and, to, and to change my life and change my attitude and change my perspective and to start seeing things under a different light. And the reason why he's saying that we should encourage each other and why we should uh, uh, live today the best we can is because he says that when we don't, we fall in the negative trap that the devil has set. And in that way, we'll not be able, will not be able to have a fulfilling relationship with God. So it is important that we keep this in mind. Because see, when we don't have the trust in God that we talked about last week, when we forget that God is with us, that God is for us, and that God is helping us, uh, then we tend to slide away from Him and, and, and we come into this cycle of negativity and what happens is that we begin to feel alone and when we feel alone when we when we have this lonely feeling that feeling robs us robs us from our experience with God robs us from having a fulfilling spiritual experience and that is exactly what the scripture speaks to us about today so the first lesson that I want to share with you is that you have no idea you have no idea what God might do through a single word of encouragement. You have no idea what God might do through a single word of encouragement. Our words are very powerful. And you see, everyone that we see today, everyone you encounter in, in, in your workplace, everyone you see at the market, everyone you see on TV, everyone you see on the street, everyone in your household has a story. And that story oftentimes is of battles that have been fought. It's of experiences that unfortunately causes us distress and discouragement. So because everyone is in the middle of these battles, we don't really understand where they're coming from. We don't really understand what's happening in their life. And if we add to that all the negativity that is going around, all the voices that speak negative to us, we find ourselves kind of like the same place that Job found himself in the scripture. You remember the story of Job. He, this, he was Job because of what we read from the scripture. Job was a godly man. Job, Job was a man that, that, that 
regarded his family in a high place. He loved his family. And Job was a man that was very responsible, and he was blessed by God. In fact, he was so wealthy that we read in the Scripture how many things he had, how many animals, possessions, houses, and, and things. But the Bible tells us that in one day, he lost everything. In one day, he lost his children, he lost his possessions, he lost his health. And to top it all, he has a wife that tells him, Job, you might as well curse God and die. Right? That's the definition of a supportive wife. And, and what happens is that Job now, Job now is struggling. He is discouraged. Imagine have all those things happening to you. And the only reason why those things happened to him was because God allowed the devil to test him. And you know, many times we forget about that. That perhaps the situations that are going around us are designed for us to get better, for us to learn a lesson, for us to improve in, in some area of our lives. So what happens to Job is that he had friends, three friends, three friends that were ready to go and give him a word of advice. And the Bible tells us that all of them came and spoke to Job. And they told him, Job... Basically, all this happened because of you. It is your fault. You are a sinner. God would not allow bad things to happen to anyone unless you are a sinner. And you know what? We believe that sometimes, but that's not necessarily true. Now, what happens to Job is that for 16 chapters, for 16 chapters, he actually 15, he listens to his friends telling them that all that had happened was his fault. So finally, Job speaks in chapter 16. And in verse 2, he says, I have heard all this before. So definitely, they were not telling him an anything new. There were theories that he had heard in the past that things happen to, bad things happen to bad people. And he knew already that. So he says, what miserable comforters you are. So in other words, he's telling his friends, you guys are pathetic. Instead of bringing me words of comfort, you guys are putting me down. You guys are bad friends. Bad, bad friends. No longer welcome in my house. And he says in verse 3, when you ever stop blowing hot air, what makes you keep on talking? Right? See, he's basically telling him, shut up. Right? Don't speak anymore. Can you say that in church? Well, I'm gonna, it's streaming. It doesn't count. And he says in verse 4, I could say the same things if you were in my place. I could have spat off criticism and shake my head at you. But notice what verse 5 says. But if, but if it were me. If it were me, says Job, I would encourage you. Notice what Job was waiting to hear from his friends were not accusations, were not the reasons why he was suffering, were not the, the logical steps of why he lost everything. He already knew all that. What Job was ready to hear was a word of encouragement, of encouragement. Notice what it says. If I were you, I would encourage you. I would try to take away your grief. What people need today, what you and I need today is not any more negativity. It's not any more bad news. What we need today is a word of encouragement. We need to encourage one another. And remember that today we have a new opportunity. You see, words have many powers, many powers. But unfortunately, a lot of what happens in our lives in the past has the power to keep us down in the future. You see, many times perhaps you remember words that were told to you when you were a child. Someone told you you were not good enough. Someone told you you would not amount to anything. And when you have a dream, when you have hopes, those words are like a banner that is raised in the back of your head and you remember the moment, the place. And now you're grown up. Now you're an adult. Now you have responsibilities. But when you hear those words back in your mind, you turn back to that little kid, that little boy when you were told that you were not good enough. Perhaps the words that have hurt you the most have come from people that you love or that you appreciate. It is tough when you uh, had a relationship and, and, and whoever you were in that relationship with told you, you, I don't love you anymore. Because you start second-guessing yourself. You start asking, am I good enough? 
Do I deserve to be loved? And now for the next relationships that you go to, you bounce on and off and you sabotage your relationships yourself because you don't think you're good enough because you remember the one time somebody told you that you were not loved, that they didn't love you. But think about this for a second. Perhaps that person was not so lovable. So you don't have to pay in the future for whatever was told to you in the past. Or perhaps you're living with criticism, constant criticism. Maybe now you go to your job with a project, with an idea, and you remember that day when you came to school with your project for science and you were in first grade and somebody told you, oh, that's not good, oh, that's missing something. And that criticism still comes to your mind every time that you bring a project to your work because you think you're missing something, you're not good enough. Those words, those negative words remain in, your, in, in, in our minds as, as sharp knives that poke us every time that we need encouragement and al also words of attack. You know, today uh, we have developed something that I like to call keyword courage. And, and, and what it is is that we don't get to see the other person that we're attacking on social media. We don't see their face. We just type away our ideas. We just type away the, the reasons why they're wrong. And we don't care about feelings. We don't care about emotions. That's another reason why I really don't like texting. You know, texting is a convenience, but I hate it. Because oftentimes you miss the feelings that are behind the text. You don't see the expression. You don't see the sentiment of the words that were typed. And what happens is that oftentimes we know and, 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 and we mean those things. But just to soften the blow, we just type at the end, LOL. But those words remain. Those words are present. And oftentimes we don't even realize that we hurt people when we say things. And that's the sad thing about it. So the second lesson that I want to share with you today is that we have to remember the power of our words. Not just that a, a word of encouragement can t go a long ways, but also we have to remember that our words have power. And that power, the Bible says, the wise man wrote in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 1, the tongue, notice, the tongue can bring death or life. And today we could add the tongue, the keyboard, the post, <laughs> has the power to bring death or life. And those who love to talk will read the consequences. That means, that means that every word that you type, every word that you say, every word that you give to someone in whatever medium you use, will have consequences. And either those consequences will be that you're building that person up or that you're tearing them down. You have to remember the power of, of our words. Because the words that I say build faith. Build the faith on an individual. Build their, 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 their spirituality or takes it down. The words that I say have the power to build confidence. Build, have the power to, to build self-esteem. You know, that's why it's important that, that, that to children, we tell them words of affirmation. We tell them words of value. It's not what they do that makes them important. It's who they are. And that's why we as parents, we love our children not because of the things they do, not because of the grades they make, although we want them to make good grades because it's good for the future. And I'm speaking to someone today. But the words that we say... The loving words that we say and with things that we do as parents is because we love you, because you are our children. And you know, in, in a church community, all children are our children. And we should, encu we should encourage all of them, not looking at what they're doing wrong, especially when they're, when they're, when they're young and in that age full of energy and they're doing things and laughing and enjoying. You know, that's the beauty of life. And some of us already are getting on the older side and we kind of get grumpy at times and we want silence and everything. You know, it's not their fault that they're young. And it's not our fault that, they're, that we're older. But as older and wiser, we should encourage them to use that energy and to become all that they can be instead of wasting life away by making bad choices. So our words have the power to build people up. Also, our words represent who we believe who God is for us. Our words represent our faith in God. Because how we speak about people, how we speak 
towards people, we represent in our God. Our God is represented in the words that we say when we refer to someone regarding, regarding their color of skin. Or regarding their own beliefs. Our God is bigger than that. Our God is, is bigger than anything that we can say that is negative. Because God designed the plan of redemption to cover our faults. So our mouths should not be used to point out negativity. Our, wor our words should be used to exalt the value that God sees in every single one of us. So if we remember to use words, use them for encouragement. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, in the New International Version, I like this particular text, the way it's written. Notice what it says. But encourage one another daily. But encourage one another daily daily. This is so powerful because it tells us that encouragement should not be something that we only practice every once in a while. Encouragement should be something that we practice as our normal routine, as our daily activity. And I have to think about the times that I've encouraged people. And you know what, what, what I've been so happy about is that you have been incredibly awesome. I mentioned the other day that I never took a class in seminary how to minister during a pandemic. I never did. And I don't think Pastor Jillian did either. So we had no idea what to do when we got into this. We had no idea how long it was going to last. And perhaps looking back, we could see that we could have done things a little bit better. But for sure, we learned some things. And we try to, to minister to you in the best way we can. And you guys have been so incredible because you have emailed us. You have sent us texts. You have... Send us messages. Some of you have even called us on the phone to tell us to hang in there and to keep doing what we're doing because we've been a blessing. And at times I scratch my head, really? Were you listening to the sermon that I just preached? But God has been good to us and he's been using you to give us words of encouragement. And that is exactly what I'm talking about. That we don't know the story. We don't know the battle that someone is going through. But our words can, lift, can help to lift them up in those moments when they're down. So it says, be in, uh, but encourage one another daily. And the reason why we have to encourage one another daily is because the devil is in the business or telling us the opposite. You see, the devil is in the business of telling us lies. And some of those lies are the negativity that we are living with. For example, oftentimes we think that because or what the devil and, and sin presents in front of us, that it's easier to find happiness outside of God's will. But at the end of the story, we'll find that it's emptiness and, re and regret. Oftentimes, we, we hear from, from, from sin and the devil that he tells us that about the things that we don't have. And we long for the things that we don't have. And in that process, we forget the things that we have and we forget to be to, to be grateful about the things that we have. And then we grow with this discontent and we buy, want to buy everything that we see online and every ad that comes out on our Facebook feed, we want to buy the stuff because we are not content with what we have. Another scene that the devil tells us that, uh, that, that shows us the negativity is that you don't matter. That's why you need to change your image. That's why, that's why you need to change yourself. That's why you have to have things to make you valuable. Especially when we look at some of the Instagram pictures that people post and the vacations they take. And, and when, when they have the proper lighting and the proper background and, and the right pose. And oftentimes we think, man, I've never been to that place. I wish I had that body. I wish I looked that good. But that's just a lie that the devil needs to tell us to, de to, to, to devalue who we are. But in reality, we are the most precious thing that God has placed on earth. And we don't need anything extra to give us more value because we are already worth the blood of the Lamb. So because we need encouragement daily, we need to remember to encourage one another. Be generous with it. So the third lesson that I want to share with you today is not just to... To, to think about the power that one encouraging word can give when, when God uses us. And to remember the power of our words. But to think, if you think something to say that is good, just say it. 
If you think of something good to say, say it. Why are we going to rob someone of the blessing of hearing something good? Don't be selfish. If you see someone and if you think something good about that, just say it. Encourage somebody. Be a blessing. You know, I was reading a, an article about a hundred things that need, kids need to hear to feel good about themselves. And, and, and these things that they need to hear to feel good about themselves, you know, it, it's about what we see in them. It's about what we believe about them. It's about hope for them. And, 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 and all these things are building blocks on which kids feel better about themselves. So parents, right now that we have them at home, we have a better chance to talk to them and to encourage them to be better. So take this staying at home school as a blessing, not as a curse. And, and also when we share something good, something nice, something encouragement with others, let's make it natural. Let's not push it. Let's not be weird. But if you can, if it's appropriate, make it spiritual. For example, if you see somebody playing in, in, in a game and you said, hey, that was a good game. And just add, when the, you see him smile after you see that, God gave you a talent. Make it spiritual. Right? Or maybe a, a co-worker at work that what a, got a promotion, don't be jealous about it. Your time will come if, you, if you're resilient, if you keep working hard. But said, hey, congratulations on the promotion. That is a blessing from heaven. Words of encouragement. Or perhaps to your husband or your wife. You know, maybe instead of criticizing your husband because it's not spiritual enough, just thank him next time you come to church or next time you tr he turns on the TV to watch the streaming, tell him, hey, thank you for doing that. It was a blessing. But be positive about those things. Be positive about the things that are done. Not, don't focus on the negative, focus on the positive. I'm not saying to ignore the negative, but what I'm saying is that when we encourage people, when we want people to be built up, it's through encouragement, not to putting people down. And sometimes the reality is that the person that needs the most help, it's you. It's me. And it's very difficult to be encouraging to others when we ourselves need encouragement. Because everyone is facing a battle. And oftentimes that smiling face that people see, it's really broken inside. Oftentimes that self-assurance that people are looking at, it's a lonely person inside. And many times, you know, when everything appears to be all together, the truth is that there's a mess inside that heart. So how, what can we do to encourage ourselves when we feel down? Because the reality is that oftentimes we don't hear encouraging words from anybody else. We live in a negative world. But that doesn't mean that we cannot receive encouragement. In fact, David, you know David, King David, before he became king, before he became king, I'm eating my words, before he became king, David was a warrior. And a warrior who, has, who had a, a, a noble cause. He wanted to help Israel to be free from the Philistines. You see, Saul the king, he was not doing his job. He was worried about chasing David, but he was letting the Philistines run rampant in the kingdom. So what David was doing, he was doing actually the job of the king. Even though he didn't have an army, he only had 300 rebels that were with him cha being chased by Saul. At the same time, he was helping rescue villages of Israel from the Philistine army. So he would go from here to there, and even at the time, when what he was doing is that he was living in Ziklag, in a town that belonged to the Philistines. And he was hiding from Saul, and he was fighting the Philistines. So it was crazy what David was doing. And one day, he goes on battle, and when he comes back to Ziklag, where, his fam where the family of every one of his army and his family were, he comes back, and now there's no one. A group of thugs have come and found the children and the women alone and they took them as slaves and they pillaged the village and, and they left nothing. So when they return from battle, David and his men, they found that the families are gone, their wives are gone, the children are gone, the things are gone and now David feels a huge amount of pressure. pressure. Why? Because now what to do? Who did this? 
And second, now his own men are talking against them. In fact, they wanted to kill them. Notice, notice the story. Come with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 6. And this is what happened. And David was greatly distressed. Wait, what? We, we don't, David distressed? We never think of David being stressed. We never feel of David feeling down. In fact, his job was to play the harp. So, so, so the king, the harp, so, so, so harp, harp, whatever. So the, the, the guitar of the time, for, so that the king could feel good about himself. When we think of David, when he walks into, into, the, into the battlefield and the, everybody is depressed because there's a giant blaspheming in the name of God and they're afraid of him. David comes in as a 17-year-old kid and he says, what's wrong with you people? The, the, the God of heavens, the God of armies is with us. We don't think of David as being depressed. But in this case, notice what happened. So as David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him. They wanted, his own men wanted to kill him because the soul of all the people was grieved. So he's not the only one that's feeling bad. Everybody's feeling bad. Every man for his sons and for his daughters. So his men are angry. They're stressed. They're depressed. They're demoralized. They're discouraged because as they were fighting to, to free Israel, their own families have been captives. But this is what happened. But David. I love it. Every time that in the Bible there's something wrong and then it says, but. Because there's something good coming after. Notice. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. But David, even though they were threatening to kill him, even though he knew something bad and horrible had happened, David encouraged himself. In fact, this, this word encourage is the word hazag. You know, and, and hazag, it's kind of cool because it's like, like if you see a, a, a new superhero appearing in a movie, hazag, right? This guy came and he has powers and ability. And actually what it means, hazag, means to give yourself strength. That's exactly what it means. So notice what happens. Hazag is the moment when David began to preach to himself. In fact, in, the, in, the, in 1 Samuel, same, same verse, but in the King James Version, it says, but David encouraged himself. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. So see, something has happened here. Something has happened here. Because David is not just trying to pep himself up like, hey, you got this, man. You got the stuff. You know, he's not saying that to himself. He's actually remembering the moments when God had been with him. So now David gathers energy. He gathers courage. He gathers enough strength to pray a bold prayer. And in verse 8 it says, Then David asked the Lord, Should I chase after these band of raiders? Remember, his men don't want to go with him. His men are more concerned about their families. And he says, will I catch them? And the Lord, notice, and the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. And the Bible tells us that David went with his men and they recovered every single one who had been taken captive and all their belongings. Now, so positive words, this is something very interesting. Positive words are difficult to remember. But negative words are difficult to forget. So the question is, how is it that David was able to encourage himself in the Lord? Like I said before, he was not giving himself a pep talk. What he was doing is that in his mind, he was remembering every single moment when God had been present with him. Perhaps he began thinking about the moment when he, when he was taking care of the sheep of his father and the lion came. Perhaps he was thinking about the moment when the bear came and both of those animals were killed. But God using him and his bare hands to protect the animals. Perhaps he remembered the moment when in the middle of the battlefield, he took the stones that were sent to the forehead of Goliath. 
that God led through that helmet to free the people of Israel. Perhaps he was remembering the so many battles that he had to fight with his three, with his 30, with his 300. And God was with him. And, each, and in each one of those battles, David remembered that it wasn't his strength, it was the strength of God. That's why he says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. So family, today I want to ask you to think about those moments when God has been with you. When God has given you blessings, even when you didn't deserve them. When God has made His presence real with you. Because it's in those moments when you feel the worst. It's in those moments when you have the lows. When God wants to lift you up to the highest. But it can only happen when you encourage. When you have the zagaf. But God is going to be with you. In 1512, there was a man who was a writer. But most of his writings were ab about wrong things. Were about things that needed to be fixed. He saw everything that was wrong in his culture, in his church. His name, Martin Luther. But in 1512, after seeing all those bad things that, that were happening in his culture, that were happening with his church, and they could not be fixed at that particular moment. He received attacks. He was persecuted. He was secluded in a castle. He could not leave it. Martin Luther felt depressed. But in that moment of depression, he wrote again. But this time he didn't write a thesis. He didn't write a theological compendium. He didn't write a list of things that needed to be fixed and were wrong. And this time he wrote something different. He wrote a song. And this song we know today as a mighty fortress is our God. Because at that moment Martin Luther remembered the times that God had been with him. And he understood that even though he was in a castle that was supposed to protect him, nothing inside of that castle could give him the strength to be encouraged. Nothing in that ca castle could give him the, the, the support that he needed. Nothing on this earth could give him the strength that he needed in those moments when he was depressed. In fact, he knew that the only one who could give him the courage that he needed in that moment was the strength that can only come from God. What's the battle that you're facing today? What are the challenges that today have been so heavy in front of you that all you see is discouragement and inability to be successful? What are the neg negative voices that you're hearing today that are putting you down and that are telling you that you're not worthy? I want to remind you today that there's so many promises that God has given us, so many sources of strength that have given us the promise that we have a mighty fortress, that we have a strength, that we have a power that can give us the courage that we need today. The Bible tells us that we are conquerors, that we are victorious by the blood of the Lamb, that we are a new creation, that we are made in the image of the most amazing God. The Bible tells us that regardless of our sin, we are already free from the law of sin and death. The Bible tells us that we are co-heirs of the thrones with Jesus. The Bible tells us that we are saved, that we are redeemed, that we are designed to be kings and queens with Jesus for eternity. So when somebody tries to put you down today, remember who you are. Remember who you belong. When there's that thing that gives you uh, the negative vibes that this world is giving us. When, when there's somebody who's putting you down, remember who you are. Remember that you are a child and uh, that you are a son, a daughter of the Most High God. And it's Him who gives us strength. It is Him who gives us courage. It is Him who gives us value. And we don't need anything, anything extra. Because we are worth the blood of the Lamb. So today, as we go in this negative world, Remember that we have all the reasons to be positive. Not just with ourselves, but with others. Let's be a force of positivity. Let's be a force of encouragement. Let's be a force of joy in this dark world.
And as we do so, may Jesus shine through us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us to worship you this morning. Because by itself, it encourages us. It reminds us that we're not left to our own devices, but that we are in contact with the most holy God, with the most high God, with a God that was willing to give everything for us. And Father, I pray that we never forget that our value was given by you, not by a job, not by items, but that we are worthy enough to be recipients of the most incredible sacrifice that the universe has ever seen. May the words of encouragement that comes from you, that come from you, fill our hearts and our minds, and may we never be put down by any other word. Help us to remain positive in this negative world. In Jesus' name we pray.